G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for my crack at the 2023 AFL ladder prediction. I did do a way too early version, uh, I think back after the draft, because it's always fun to do, uh, but today I've done quite a considered approach. It doesn't mean I'll be any more accurate, but I'm going to have a crack at ranking the uh, order of the ladder from 18th all the way to 1st, and then give you some of the awards that I'm predicting as well. First and foremost, guys, I just want to say thank you to all uh, all of you for all the support on last video where I talked to you about my impending move to the UK as well. And it really struck me uh, how many people seem really happy for me. And I, I want to say that really touched me. Uh, it flattered me. I felt touched. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. It was uh, really quite heartfelt, some of the comments. Um, and it, it's, it's nice, I guess, to have... I guess some validation in the sense that, um, you know, sometimes you're just presenting to a screen and yes, I do read the comments, but I guess it just struck me how many of you out there um, want the best for me and I want to say thank you so much and there were some very, very kind words. I meant to reply to them and I'm going to go through that, uh, but to be honest, they were coming through thick and far, so I just want to say I'm very, very grateful. I've got a great audience in you guys and uh, thank you so much and hopefully we have a big year together. I'll need your support now uh, now more than ever, really, I guess, and uh, as such, I need to grow the channel, get some growth uh, going in terms of subscribers in particular. Um, and you know what? We just had one of the best Februaries we've ever had. I think the best February I've ever had was the February I released the Adam Simpson documentary, and I think I got within a thousand views of that or something as well. So. Uh, without even really thinking about it, we've uh, we've done really well this month. So thank you for your support. It does say that about 43% of you who watch this month still haven't subscribed. I'd love to get that number down um, so there's more of you that are subscribed to the channel because it will help for the for the growth and the algorithm as well. Um, so any help you can give me there would be much appreciated. And finally, before we get into the ladder prediction, guys, I do have to shout out the sponsor of today's video, manscaped.com, for all your male grooming needs and all of your, you know, liquid formulations to round out your routine. I'm currently holding a ball deodorant as well as a ball, uh, sorry, a crop reviver, not a ball reviver. You seek medical assistance. This is a ball toner as well. Uh, there is some ball wipes as well if, uh, if you get yourself in a sticky situation and you need to prepare for a potential romantic scenario. Uh, Manscaped's got it all. Seriously, go to their website. In addition to the Lawn Mole 4.0, which does a great job of just getting everything done very, very quickly and easily. Ceramic blades, much safer. If you want to level up your manscaping routine, make sure you go to their website and get 20% off and free shipping on any order that you make by using the code TRUEFOOTY20. It's a great product. They genuinely have sent me a heap of stuff and I genuinely use it as well. So level up your manscaping routine, 20% off, TRUEFOOTY20. But anyway... The only ball that I'm really here to talk about today is football. And uh, I'm going to go through the ladder from 18th to 1st and give you a little bit of a justification as to why I picked that team where I did. So we're going to start from the bottom and pick the wooden spoon and the team that I've got for this year's wooden spoon. After much thought and heavy consideration, I've got to say Hawthorne, to be honest. And my gut feel is that this team will prove me wrong because they're notoriously... They just play well for no reason sometimes. You know, they'll have a, a downward trend to form and then some young guns will play out of their skin. So I'm expecting a bit of that from Hawthorne this year. But if you look at their best 22, all the players that they, you know, willingly offloaded, Gunston, um, O'Meara and Mitchell in particular from that midfield, there's a lot resting suddenly on the shoulders of young mids like Newcomb and Warple, who I think are great players uh, or potentially great players. Warple dropped off a little bit. Carl Amon comes into the side, but then still Josh Ward and Will Day are still quite young and Will Day, I'm optimistic about, but that's uh, it's not a best 22 midfield or a best six or seven midfield that inspires a massive amount of confidence that they're actually going to win games as well when they've got rucks like Reeves and, and Meek they're okay but again there's no huge competitive advantage there and their key forwards as well Mitch Lewis and Kaczynski very talented don't get me wrong as particularly Kaczynski I quite like but again how many goals is that actually going to produce so I think their defense is sound. They've got great run from halfback. That is their strength. I'm not trying to overlook that. But overall, it's a week 22, limited depth, and I just can't see them winning enough games to avoid the wooden spoon. So for me, Hawks are the wooden spooners. In 17th spot, I've got North Melbourne improving by one position and avoiding the wooden spoon. I don't think they were as bad as they showed last year. Um, in the same way I've made that case for West Coast, North aren't that bad in terms of the list talent they've got. They played well below their potential. It was a 
pretty terrible season in terms of what they produced. So I just think with new coach and uh, you know a refreshed sort of mindset going into this year, they've got to improve. But the thing is, they can still improve by three wins, and that will still only be five wins, which would give them you know 17th spot most likely. I think there's a lot of upside. LDU is about to explode. Big fan of Simkin and Stevenson in terms of their potential and Zerha. All these guys are hitting that age where they might explode and under Clarkson, that could happen. But I'm not going to bet on it. And they've shored up their defense with Griffin Lowe coming into the side. We will see more of Ben Cunnington, fingers crossed. Um, and then, the, you know, Taron Thomas won't get way into that situation. But he's a player, again, that could explode and take them to the next level. Or he might not play again for them. I'm not really too sure. They'll have excitement out of guys like Sheasel. Big chance for the rising star. Uh, but overall... They'll improve, but not by enough to get out of the bottom two. In 16th, we have GWS, who I wanted to give the wooden spoon, but upon careful consideration, even though they lost Toronto and Hopper uh, out of their best 22, when you compare it to some of the other bottom sides, there's still a few established stars in that side. They've got Whitfield, Green, Haynes, uh, and then former guns, I guess, in Ward and Cornelia, who, you know, I say former guns, they're still good players, and I'm backing them in to have better seasons. Again, GWS are another side who finished, I think it was a third last or something last year. And I don't think that is a true reflection of the talent on their list, but obviously they, they got rid of their coach, which is a reflection of that. And there's some really good young players. Sam Taylor was all Australian, and uh, Tom Green could and should take his game to the next level this year. There will be development from Callahan and Ash, two good players, uh, and that's just to name a couple. There's still question marks with their forward line, Hogan and Riccardi. Again, capable players who haven't really quite put it together. Uh, Hogan's been up and down, and I think he's shown some good form there. But overall, I'm pessimistic. And I don't think they'll be as bad as uh, the wooden spoon, but there's enough talent to warrant them avoiding the bottom two. Rounding out my bottom four, I've got Essendon. And I can't lie to you, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this prediction. I feel like it's just kind of an easy thing to slot them back roughly where they finished last year. In fact, it's the same spot as they finished last year. Their best 22 is solid enough. You know, their, their midfielders are solid, well, better than solid uh, in Darcy Parrish, Zach Merritt, and then Dylan Shield as well. They're spearheaded by Peter Wright, who's turned into an absolute gun, to be honest with you. And there's some good uh, defenders down back, although they're probably lacking that real tall uh, shutdown defender as well. They've got some good uh, shorter players. I think Laverde is... I think I read that he was like the 14th tallest player on the list and he was their key back last year or, or something like that. So they do have Brad Scott coming in and this guy is a coach, while he didn't have a massive success at North Melbourne, I think he did prove that he could extract the best out of a playing group that is not massively talented. I'm not saying that's Essendon. I think there is some definitely some young talent there, but I could see this guy building them to a level this year where they avoid the bottom four, but he will need time. And to be honest with you, my trust with Essendon is a little bit low after a poor last, a poor year last year. So they rely a lot on organic improvement, and they've got some good young players, Archie Perkins, uh, Cox, Reed, and Wiedemann coming into the side of former top 10 pick, Ben Hobbs as well. So a lot of that improvement could rest on the organic improvement of young players. I just think it's a little bit early, so not this year for Essendon. In 14th spot, I think this will ruffle some feathers because I've talked them up and I'm actually really optimistic on them, but I've ended up putting Adelaide here and there's a ruffling feathers pun because of crows. I think they're an exciting young side and I think to some extent to this point, they've actually exceeded the talent level in terms of how competitive they are, the spirit that they play with, their ability to beat teams. We're looking at Adelaide a couple of years ago and thinking, you know, there's not a lot of young talent in terms of when you compare it to some of the other rebuilding sides, they really kind of had to start from scratch, or at least that was my opinion. But that talent is starting to take shape now. And I think their forward line in particular, as it was in like that 2017 era, could become a massive strength for them, for them going forward from this year. Taylor Walker, obviously we know how good he is. Darcy Fogarty, I think is poised to take the next step. He's a little bit undersized, but he's still a very, very talented player. Till Thought was uh, their pick two from a number of years ago. So some exciting tolls there. And then the smalls are even more exciting. Isaac Rankins joined the club. Joshua Shelley and Shane McAdam are very three, three very potent small forwards. I think the talent's getting there. But I still think they're another season away from being consistent enough for finals. So I definitely have them better than, or at least a level above all the teams below them. And I feel like I'm being a little bit harsh here. I think they'll be consistently tough to beat at home, but in the end, not talented enough yet, or maybe not, maybe not experienced enough yet to be consistent enough to really push for finals. So I think they'll be, you know, behind Gold Coast in terms of development. In 13th spot, I finally put 
my West Coast Eagles here, and I've been all over the place with my predictions with them because um, it's hard not to, to. It's hard to separate your head from your heart. Um, but ultimately, you know, I did a season preview uh, for them, you know, a couple of weeks back on the channel. So if you want my in-depth thoughts on where I think we're at, um, go and check that out. I think there will be genuine improvement there. It has to be, but it's largely predicated on availability of players. And there's so many players coming back into the side, it's ridiculous. I can't count them all, but three that come to mind are Elliot Yo barely played. He's close to our best player. Oscar Allen didn't play at all. Sheed played one game. And these guys are on the prime in their career. So from what I saw in the preseason, you can't go too much off preseason, but you could tell that there's a level of fitness there within the playing group. And that by itself will make them a much more competitive team. They're nowhere near as bad as they showed last year. Again, similar to Adelaide, I think they'll be tough to beat at home. And I think there's, you know, when you compare them to Adelaide, I think the best 22 is a little bit more established, a little bit more consistent. I mean, I've only got them one spot, spot apart. The reliance on Nick Nat's dominance is their biggest Achilles heel going into this year. Oh, that's a pun. He's currently got a sore Achilles. That wasn't intentional. But I think if he misses games, which is, you know, every chance, then I think the Eagles will get exposed because they don't have the next layer of, you know, ruck depth to really win games, to be honest. Bailey Williams and Jamison, young and developing. And I don't think the midfield is potent enough to overcome the cracks that would be there when Nat Nui's not playing. So we'll see. If Nat Nui plays 20 games, they could finish higher. I think there'll be a push towards youth. And I think they'll just languish somewhere in the middle. Overall, West Coast in 13th. In 12th, I've got St. Kilda. Uh, again, another one I find it so hard to peg these guys because they can be all over the place. Last year, uh, they finished 10th and they squandered a start of 8-3, and three, which meant in the second half of the year, they went 3-8, and eight, so a perfect mirror image. They finished with 11 wins and 11 losses, and this included some bad losses in the second half of last year as well. A 35-point loss to Essendon, who finished bottom four, a 41-point loss to Fremantle, a side they shouldn't be that much worse than, and 51 points to Sydney as well. So while these aren't bad teams necessarily in Sydney and Frio, obviously it wasn't as competitive as an 8-3 and three start to the season would forecast. So I think they fell off the perch hard, and that could carry into next year. I just don't think I see it with their best 22 to be a realistic chance for finals this year where I think there will be some very good contenders. They're also without King for the first six weeks of the season. Membry's in a race to be fit for round one, so we'll see. But King is a massive loss. It's a talented midfield, but it's a workman-like one. Jack Steele is an out-and-out star. He's supported with guys like Ross, Crouch, and Clark, and none of these guys necessarily have that X factor to really build a well-rounded midfield, even though it's solid, but it's not amazing. I do think Ross Lyon will set them on the straight and narrow, but he's not going to do it in season one, is my prediction, and that's why they're 12th. In 11th spot, I've got the Gold Coast Suns, uh, and they've taken good strides consistently over the years, year by year, close to linear improvement under Stewie Jew, and 11th spot would actually be their best ever finish, so I don't think I'm ragging them too hard by not having them closer to the finals. It's a very potentially, well, it's a potentially very solid midfield now with uh, Jared Witts in the ruck, tapping it down to Took Miller, potential Brownlow medalist, and we know who Rowan Anderson are, and they could be on the verge of a breakout. So again, organic improvement could really shift Gold Coast one way or the other. Importantly, Ben King returns to this side as the mainstay key forward, and you add in uh, Lacocious and Chol, and I think as a, as a trio, there's, there's a bit of danger there. They lose Rankin, but overall there's a bit of a dangerous element to that forward line. To sum it up, I think there'll be linear improvement again. I just don't see them taking a massive step yet until we see real consistent performance for performances from Raul and Anderson. I don't have them quite in the finals mix just yet, but they'll be close. In 10th spot, I have the Western Bulldogs. And again, this side, it's, it's an agonizing prediction, this one. Uh, I've been all over the place myself, uh, but they've also been all over the place over the last few years in terms of where they finish. Last year, they snuck into the top eight uh, due to Carlton's loss in the final round to Collingwood. They got through on percentage. They let slip something like a seven-goal lead in the elimination final and lost to Fremantle. Um, so a pretty disappointing way to end that year, and, and it kind of belied the talent that they've got on their list. So again, it's probably just a lack of genuine faith in the Bulldogs, which means that I'll get that wrong, and then they'll absolutely deliver on that promise this year. They've added some tall timber in Jones and Lobb. So Jones comes in as that key defender, Roy Lobb as another attacking option who can pinch hit in the ruck as well. So structurally, they're a bit more sound. But let's not forget they're losing Josh Dunkley, who has been an A-grade midfielder forward for them over a number of years now. They lost Lockie Hunter as well, who's been a pretty solid player for them as well. And while the midfield is still strong, that was the strongest part of the ground. And now that absolute A-plus midfield that they had has been weakened. And yes, they've improved structurally, but it's not clear that their best 22 has necessarily improved. 
So it's that combined with a, a bit of a lack of confidence in putting the dogs high on my ladder. So I've got, I've got them out of the eight, but I could be wrong. They could finish third. They could win the flag. In ninth spot, this is the prediction that will cop the most negative attention. I've got Fremantle sliding out of the eight this year, and this was a tough decision, and it's not actually predicated on not rating them, and I'll go into depth about that soon. And I I feel like I have a good relationship with Freo fans on the True Footy channel. Um, there's plenty out there that think for an eagle I'm not that disgusting, uh, which is flattering, but I can't not put Fremantle outside the eight simply because I don't want to alienate those people. So I'll tell you why. I don't see Fremantle regressing badly. I think the top eight will genuinely be tough this year. There's a lot of teams... Uh, you know, I just had the Western Bulldogs in 10th. They made the finals last year. There's a lot of teams that are competing for eight spots. It's, it's going to be a tough top eight to crack. And with Fremantle, I don't think we can underrate losing Lobb, who kicked 36 goals last year in an area of relative weakness for them. David Mundy has been an absolute star for a long time, but even late in his career. Griffin Logue and Blake Akers, um, you know, Blake Akers had a terrific year last year, and Logue, they probably won't miss structurally because, you know, he found himself in and out of that side, sort of played forward as well. I do think... Overall, losing those players will have an impact. And I'm not sure if Jackson and O'Meara will come in and offset that loss immediately. I think O'Meara will be a solid and dependable midfielder. We know he's a good player. He's probably that B-plus midfielder. And Luke Jackson is a potential superstar, but that could be... That's a 10-year investment they've made in him, and I don't necessarily think it's going to translate this year. Unless he pulls out 35 goals as a, you know split time forward. I don't see that happening. I think Fremantle have lost a bit in terms of depth and structure. I think they're tremendously talented. Don't get it twisted. That young midfield uh, and then there's some, you know, fl flankers like Hayden Young as well. Jai Amos has a stack of potential as a top 10 pick. Erasmus and Johnson have, and Johnson hasn't played yet. Erasmus has played a little bit. There's heaps of potential there. I just don't think this is the year. So I think they'll stagnate as a young group and they'll be better for it and they'll come back hard in 2024. Hey guys, I just want to interrupt this video for one brief moment to talk to you a little bit about Druzy's Athlete Academy. We're now in partnership with the True Footy YouTube channel as well. So if you're not aware, my good friend Druzy has launched his own online strength and conditioning coaching business. The service that he provides is online one-on-one -on -one coaching directed at young athletes who are trying to take their game to the next level. Drew's has gone and got qualified as a sports scientist, and now he can provide professional strength and conditioning coach for anyone looking to take their fitness game to the next level. Whether you're a young prospective athlete who wants to level up, who wants to get drafted, or potentially, you know, play another sport to a very, very high level, your strength and conditioning is so central to that, and Drew's can give you personalized programs tailored to your specific needs. But it's not just for athletes. If you're just someone who wants to get into the gym or perhaps has been going to the gym for a while and has started to stagnate, the benefit of Drewsy's Athlete Academy is that because he's a qualified sports scientist, you can take out all the guesswork and you can get personalized programs to help you fulfill whatever your goals are. There's running programs, there's gym beginner programs, there's muscle bulk programs. I know personally for me, I started getting into the gym about 10 years ago. I was a skinny little rat and some might say I'm still a skinny rat, but regardless, bulking up, getting a bit of muscle, feeling confident in my own fitness was the best thing I ever did. And I know that there's a huge correlation between how good I'm feeling in my general well-being and how strong and fit I'm feeling as well. So with the partnership you have through True Footy, you can get 20% off on any program at Drewsy's Athlete Academy. You simply just have to use the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout on the website. So do go check out the website. The link for that is in the description. And remember, you get 20% off and you'll be investing in yourself. So it would be money well spent. So to rub salt in the wounds of Fremantle fans who just had me them missing the eight, they're probably going to be unhappy that I've actually selected Port Adelaide scraping in to my top eight. I really wanted to put the power in the top eight. I just think they're too good to leave out. Yes, they had a disappointing year last year. They started 0-5. They went 10-7 and after that, which showed they kind of got their shit together. And in that 22 that they have, I think it stacks up really, really well. And I think eighth could be conservative. I think this team has the potential to really contend for the flag. It is potential though. They burned us last year. We all predicted them to go close. They got nowhere near it. But their best 22 sells me hard. You got Boak and Wines. Obviously, Boak is a fine wine. Wines, uh, there's a pun there. I can't be bothered making it. Uh, Connor Rosie is a potential A-grade superstar as well. And he's going to be another year older this year. Zach Butters, Jason Horn Francis. All these guys just have untapped potential. And I think this is the year it could click. I say the same thing every year about Zach Butters. But this could be the year. Structurally, they're sound. Uh, we know how good Alia Alia is and Tom Jonas as well. And they've got a small forward dynamic now that is really exciting. Fantasia barely played last year. Junior Rioli is an absolute superstar. And if he gets consistent footy in terms of getting his body right, which I think he's, his body's looking pretty good, to be fair to him, I think their best 22 is capable of at least top six. But I'm going to say eighth. 
because I'm a pussy. In seventh spot, I have got the Collingwood Footy Club who enthralled the AFL world last year by finishing top four with remarkably just 104%, which speaks to that narrative of them just winning close games throughout the year. They've lost Grundy. They lost uh, Ollie Henry as well. They've added Tom Mitchell, Dan McStay, Bobby Hill, and uh, Frampton as well as a key defender. So they've reinforced their midfield, and I think most important of all, they've got a mainstay key forward option. Again, puns, McStay, mainstay, oh, it's all happening. They were probably the most exciting side to watch last year, and the question will be, can they back it up after an emotional roller coaster? And they, they probably will, to be honest, and seventh might seem a little bit harsh. But again, you look at the close wins that they had, 104%, there's an element of luck, and you probably that's probably harsh because they won those games in their own right, like Jamie Elliott's a superstar. But logically speaking, the way the ball bounces, it does sort of indicate that they're not that much better than the opponents that they defeated in all of those games. And therefore, again, logically speaking, it's more likely that they'll drop a few of those games again in this year. It's probably a flawed way of looking at it, but I don't think Collingwood are necessarily an entrenched top four lock in this year. So that's why I've got them in seventh. But again, they're good enough to go all the way and win the flag. I know that sounds stupid, but I equally believe both things. In sixth, I've got Richmond. Um, and again, you could probably toss the coin who's going to finish higher out of Collingwood and Richmond. But I've gone with this order. Richmond in sixth. Their one greatest weakness last year in terms of list balance from my perspective, and I think it's plain to see, was their midfield. And they already finished, I think it was seventh last year and lost that elimination final. They've added two potentially elite midfielders in Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper. So I don't think I've ever seen a midfield get that much of a facelift, that much of an upgrade in one single off season. And there may be some teething issues, but now that is a genuinely decent midfield with uh, Dion Prestia, probably the next best midfielder in there. Dusty's going to rotate through there. Cochin as well. Yes, their best players are past their prime, but there's still some young talent there to come in and support that. And there's a bit more of a better list transition, I think, for Richmond. So I think they're going to be around the mix again. That midfield is now a relative strength. I don't consider them a serious flag contender because... Probably too many of those players are past their prime. Are they going to deliver consistently for 24 rounds now? Probably not, but I can't say the missing finals. Richmond in sixth. In fifth spot, I have the runners-up from last year, the Sydney Footy Club. Again, this one might be controversial because they've been a great side for two years consistently. There's tons of organic improvement that come from Sydney as well. There's so much young talent, or at least players that are just not quite in their prime yet. They're, they're delivering earlier than expected. And there's still a lot of improvement to come with guys like Logan McDonald, uh, Braden Campbell, Errol Golden. I, I could go on and on. There's so many young players that will take this side through for the next 10 years. Because they've improved so much quicker than expected, I think it's kind of quite possible that we see a year of stagnation from Sydney. And I'm still only putting them second to fifth. Um, but they may dip down and come back up. And that's kind of the vibe I have with Sydney. It's not a talent issue. Um, and you also factor in, they got absolutely belted in the grand final. And statistically, that has a negative impact on teams the next year for whatever reason. So they're the unlucky ones for me. I've got them sliding out of the top four, but they're still going to be a good team this year. In fourth spot, I've got my surprise packet this year, Carlton. This is their this is their time. There's always a surprise packet this year. And I did say last year that I was going to stop predicting these things because they blow up in my face so consistently. But Carlton, I think there's a lot of good, solid logic as to why I think they could be a potential powerhouse in the years to come. Their tall timber is arguably the best in the league. Mackay and Kerno as a forward duo is absolutely unreal. you got Weedering down the other end as well. On top of that, a midfield starring Patrick Cripps, who's just won the Brownlow medal. Sam Walsh, we know how good he is. And then supported by Chera, Hewitt, and now Blake Akers. There's consolidated depth now. they got some talented flankers, obviously Sam Doherty. There's a ton of potential, I think, in Jack Martin as a forward as well. And we've never really seen him in a really strong side yet. So I do kind of have a feeling that he's going to explode if given the opportunity in a side that plays finals. Carlton went 8-2 last year, and it all kind of derailed a little bit after that. But to be honest, I'm choosing to look at that more optimistically because of the trajectory that I think they're on talent-wise. And I think it's a sign of the future. It may not be this year. I might be going early crow. But Carlton top four is my bold call. In third spot, I have the Brisbane Lions. And going through this analysis, um, it's a strong case to be made that this side has the best tw best 22 in the competition right now, and their depth is solid as well. So it's very easy to make the case why Brisbane will be a big contender in this year. They've got um, you know already a strong team that's added Josh Dunkley, Jack Gunston, Will Ashcroft through the draft, and Jasper Fletcher as well. Fletcher, I don't know how much impact he'll have this year, but Ashcroft, I think, will have an impact this year. It's an elite midfield, 
and it's a dangerous forward line now that excites me. I think Josh Dunkley was like the second highest goal kicker for the Bulldogs last year, so he can transfer that to the Brisbane Lions as well, and you add Gunston as well. He's probably the biggest value pickup in last year's offseason in terms of the cost and what he's likely to produce in a side that is going to finish top four, in my opinion. I think the Lions will be a strong home and away side once again, that's proven. For them, again, they just need to deliver in finals. I haven't decided whether I think they're capable yet, despite last year's MCG win. But I'm not going to be brave enough to bet against the Lions finishing in the top four. They're too strong a side. They're a good side throughout the home and away season. The consistent third. Finishing second at the end of the home and away season, I have the Melbourne Footy Club. And we already know how good Melbourne are. I don't really know how much I need to sell the Melbourne Footy Club to you. It was only 2021. We saw them win a premiership in emphatic fashion. And there hasn't been, you know, veterans sort of retiring or players passing through their prime. Last year, we didn't see the best version of Melbourne. By the end of the year, they were quite flat. They went out in straight sets. They were playing nowhere near their best footy. And you can make the argument they've been found out strategically. But I think it's possible that they were just off as a footy club. I'm backing them in to not only be good this year, but for a number of years to go. And I think they will be one of the biggest contenders this year, if not the biggest. So they lost Jackson and replaced him with Brody Grundy. So in terms of the immediacy of this upcoming season, I don't think they lose too much from a ruck point of view. And they've reinforced their depth a bit with Lockie Hunter, who is a very capable midfielder. He won't be the star midfielder for him, but he adds a bit of depth for them. And if, you know, Petrarca or... Oliver get injured now. They've got some uh, a backup that's not quite as talented. But either way, that depth will prove useful. And uh, Shaki replaces Wiedemann as well. So I think we know what we're getting with Melbourne. It's just a case of do you think they will return to their best this year? And I'm going to back them in. Finally, in first spot, I've got the Geelong Footy Club. Wow, what a boring prediction. The Premiers from last year will finish top of the ladder. Uh, but again, how much do I need to sell you on Geelong? Uh, it's a fantastic best 22. Star started all across the field. Yes, they've lost Selwood. And then they've replenished it famously with Jack Bowes, Tanner Bruin, um, Jai Clark through the draft as well. And Max Holmes is showing a bit of promise as an inside mid too. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to his role uh, with Selwood out of the side. I don't even think Selwood, often by himself, is that central to their success. They're just a fantastic team. They've got superstars all over the field, and yes, they're in the twilight of their career, but I don't think they will necessarily decline this year. I could be wrong. It's, it is coming. It is coming. I know we say that every year. It's coming, but I'm going to say not this year. I don't think they'll go back-to-back, -back. and then let's talk about the grand final. I've got Melbourne defeating Carlton in the grand final. Just to shake it up a little bit, I think we'll have a surprise grand final. I've got Carlton finishing fourth, which means they'll probably upset the Cats in the prelim to go all the way to the grand final, but they won't be as good as Melbourne, who will win their second flag in three seasons. The Brownlow medal will be Clayton Oliver. It's time. I said in another video recently, Bont potentially as well, maybe a tie, but if I had to just pick one, I'm going to go Clayton Oliver. The rising star, I'm going to give you the most boring prediction ever and say Will Ashcroft will win it. I want to say Harry Sheasel, just to mix it up a little bit, but Ashcroft's going to come in. He's going to get regular footy. He's going to win plenty of it. He's going to use it well, and the side's going to be good. He's going to stand out. So, Aside from injury, touch wood, Will Ashcroft will win the Rising Star Award. And Coleman, boring option. Jeremy Cameron kicked 65 goals, I think, last year in 24 games. Geelong will be a good side this year as well. Maybe Carlton find a few other avenues to go other than Mackay and Kerno, who are in theory competing with each other again. So that's why I've gone against that prediction. Jeremy Cameron for the Coleman. All right, guys, that wraps up my predictions for the 2020 season. I should let you know as well, guys, we do have a footy tipping competition and an AFL fantasy uh, competition loaded up as well. So with the footy tipping, if you have previously been part of the footy tipping comp, it should still be in there. You don't have to join, but if you want to double check, the link is in the description as well, as well as uh, anyone who wants to join for the first time. The AFL Fantasy comp is different. I have to make a new one with its new invite code, so get around it in the description of this video, guys. Let's all take part. Should be lots of fun if you enjoy fantasy. But other than that, that's it for me now, guys. So uh, I'll see you soon. I think uh, as I record this, we're going into our first, or so, sorry, second round of JLT. It's not called JLT, damn it. As I'm recording this, it is the second round of preseason games kicking off this afternoon as well. So I'll, I'll try and do a wrap up video of that as well, um, which would be good. So hopefully no one does, you know, a major injury touch wood as I record this and then it will impact my predictions. I don't know. But either way, looking forward to it. Looking forward to you guys joining me this year. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.